Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Cleaning and Cocktails. This episode though, as you'll see, and we'll talk about, we're gonna, it's a special episode called Cleaning and Creatine. And you're gonna know why. Yeah. I have a awesome guest with me. I also have my man, partner in crime, Ricky Funk. But we have Mark Hebrick. Did I pronounce that right? No, it's Herbick. Herbick. That's okay. It's been worse. Mark Herbick. Uh, he's local. A lot of people in the BSC space know Mark. Uh, he's from Persant. He is the founder and CEO of Persant. Uh, but he's also comes from the BSC space, and we're going to get into all that. We're going to get into a lot of cool things, why we're drinking creatine yeah. and things like that, right? Uh, but here, cheers. Cheers. Good being with you guys. Thank cheers. you for coming on, Mark. I appreciate it. Let me see how this tastes. Let's see. I worked on this recipe for hours, so it should be awesome. And it's not all creatine, just saying. That's, no. that's what be my wife. Out, you'd that, be bouncing off the walls. That's what my wife wants me to make. She gets mad. I was telling you earlier. She's like, Rick, put some love. <laughs> you, I, I put water, creatine powder, and protein powder. She's like, "What is that?" I could tell. We got some bananas in there. What else we got? We got we got bananas. We got chocolate. We got almonds. We've got almond milk. Um, we've got the creatine, and we've got some flaxseed in there. Yeah, um, see, we're healthy. So it's not always just yeah. about drinking, guys. Well, right. Five percent. <laughs> <laughs> so you got uh, so Mark. We got some cool stuff to talk about. Um, I thought it would be awesome to have you uh, on the show because the, we've had one episode on M&A, but that was from fellow BSCs that were involved with an with a acquisition. But with you, uh, again, the audience is more smaller to mid-sized contractors, but I think it'd be fitting for, for us to take them on the journey and why they should always be ready mm -hmm. to, to sell, right? Because yeah. you know, stuff that we talked about earlier is if we are in search of acquiring a company, it could hold up some stuff and deals can go south if the seller is, uh, is not prepared. Right. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that guys. I'm going to, um, we're going to talk about while we're drinking this kind of cocktail. Uh, and really I got Ricky on with us, Mark, cause he went through an acquisition himself, right? He is kind of like, he is the target audience, mm -hmm. uh, for this show and how we're emp empowering them to learn more about not just cleaning techniques, mm -hmm. uh, but cleaning business, yeah. how, to, how to run it how to get it to where you can sell. So I thought he would have some good, um, good notes to bring to the table. But tell us a little bit more about yourself. I got some notes on you, but yeah. again, tell the um, audience who you are and, and why you love the BSC space. You were supposed to leave it. Yeah. You never really did. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's um, I thought I was out and they pulled me back in. <laughs> so um, when I was in my teens, my father was a building service contractor. And he always wanted me to get involved in this industry. And I said, this is not a sexy industry. I'm going to be just doing something much cooler when I grow up. And it's yeah. not going to be a janitor. And um, it was one evening when he was shorthanded at a building downtown. And I was 15, 16 at the time. He says, can you help me out in the city? And I'm like, I told you, I really don't want anything to do with this business, but I'll help out. And he's like, the bonus is it's the Playboy building. Oh, in downtown Chicago. And I'm like, all right, not a bad I'm first, in. not a bad first. I'm, I'm like, and do I get to run the swing machine? He's like, yes, you can run the swing machine. You don't have to do the bathrooms. So he talked me into going in and helping him. And I helped out periodically, but I really did want to pursue my own path. I had no interest in the janitorial industry. Um, and so I went out and did my own thing, entrepreneurial. The first business I had out of high school is I opened a gym. And then I want, went on to acquire other fitness centers after that. I sold all my fitness centers when I was in my early 20s um, for no other reason though that I was just killing myself with all these and there was not a lot of margin mm -hmm. in the fitness center industry. But this is back in the 80s before fitness has hit the level that it is today. Yeah. So margins weren't there. Um, so I got involved at an entrepreneurial level in some other industries and my father said, well, I'm looking to get out. I'm looking to sell. And I said, I would consider buying it because I've finally recognized the value of an the industry value, yeah. where there's recurring revenues, low capital investment, and recession resistant, because I'm getting smacked by all that stuff right now. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the other deal was, you're not part of the business. Because I, love, I, love, yeah, yeah. I love my dad, but, but, but him and I working together was like oil and water. Mm. Wow. So we agreed on a one-year transition period. At the end of three weeks, he said, you know what, you got this, and he left. 
And I'm like, wait, oh, one year wait, to three wait. weeks. I needed a year. <laughs> Good luck. He's like, no, no, you're you're a smart kid. You got this. Those are your first. So I made a shit ton of mistakes, you know, the first year. Uh, but I went on to acquire about a half a dozen other facility maintenance companies. After that, I got involved in some other adjacent industries, some other services. Um, 2002, somebody came along, you know. Right place, right time, right deal, and offered to buy a group of my companies. Uh, so I divested about half of the businesses that I had in 2002, and then uh, proceeded to really reinvest all that into growing the remaining platforms. And then in 2007, it was the same. It, I, I, it was it was the right place, right time for sure. But it was also it was essentially me waking up and saying, you know what, I want to do something different now. Yeah, you know this industry is a twenty four seven grind. During the day, you are game on with your clients and your management and your leadership, and at night, all the work's being done. Yeah, and I couldn't sleep well at night, knowing that I knowing that I had fifteen hundred employees running around doing work on my behalf. Mm -hmm. So it were not restful nights mm -hmm. um, because my conscience, you know, kind of kept me awake. Yeah, and you know after. A total of about 15 years of that, I said, you know what, it's been a great run, but I'm out, and this is a great opportunity for me to exit, so I just decided to do that. Um, but you exited to then? Well, so in the early then. 2000s, I had become a member of an organization called YPO, the Young Presidents Organization, and my relationships essentially became middle market CEOs of companies. And they grew to kind of know me as a deal guy. So they would call me to help them get their deals done, whether it be make an acquisition, so, do a sale, raise some capital. So I did that as a favor. So when you, so did you have experience, you were doing this hands on yourself? Yes. When you first acquired, right. when, you, when you were acquiring for your, your current, right. B, or your BSC, no experience. You just, you yeah. learned the craft yourself? Yeah, I was OJT. Okay. Yeah. That's it. So, um, I mean, I was going to school at the time as well, but, but not, you don't go to school for M&A. Yeah. You know, you go to school for finance, accounting, and, you know, general business skills. But um, so I had help, started helping other people do M&A just as a favor. And then when I exited, the phone kept ringing. And, and it was BSCs and a lot of other middle market CEOs as well. I said, hey, I know you're not an operator anymore. Can you help me with my deal? And I said, yes, I'm going to have to start charging you now, though. Yeah. I was, I'm going to start a firm, and I'm going to build a team, and it's all going to be a blast. So... Fast forward to today, started the firm in 2010, uh, so we're now 13 years into this. Um, we work on about 50 to 60 transactions a year, variety of different industries. Um, our single largest sector is the building maintenance sector. Um, I get involved in all those deals just because of my institutional knowledge about the industry yeah. um, and my sick passion yeah. for it. You know, anybody that's passionate about this industry has something a little bit so off about it. Because, you know, <laughs> chances are if your phone rings in this industry, it's not a good thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, I got it, those it, calls. It's a problem, and chances are one of your people created it. Yeah. You know, so, and, 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 and that's okay. I mean, it kind of is what it is. It is what it is. Um, yeah. So you develop, you know, a sick passion, you know, yeah. for the industry. But I feel like uh, that, that's got to be a strong competitive advantage for you, right? The, the value add that you bring, because you, you are familiar with, when being a BSC, yeah, absolutely. You know? When Ricky's going through a deal, whether he's looking to buy or sell, or you, um, I, I have the skills of an M and A advisor and an investment banker, but I also have the emotional mindset of the buyer and the seller. Mm -hmm. Because for a seller, you know, they say, "Oh, this is just business." That's bullshit. If you're a seller, selling your business is personal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're a buyer. It's all business. Yeah. There's no emotional attachment to this thing. Because yeah, this it's is somebody yours. else's kid. Somebody it's not your kid. kid. It's your baby. It, it, yeah, and <laughs> and I mean, it, it's there's there's just no passion there. Um, so you you're a lot of buyers stomp around very in a very insensitive manner, thinking that this is just business for the seller, just like it's just business for me, and it's not. No. So uh, I can identify with the emotional roller coaster that a seller is on because I've been on it, and I can identify with the business decisions that a buyer is making because I've been in that seat as well. Yeah. See, I mean, that's, that's, that's key, like on both sides. So, you know, like the emotions for somebody to sell their business, it's gotta be, uh, you know, for, again, this is why the purpose I wanted to have you on here too, Mark, is for those that are, are, well, you said it earlier, you should always be thinking, 
of this, right? What did you say? There's only two. Well, outs, like we were right? talking there's two earlier. or three outs. There's, there, there's there's two. There's really three outs in this industry. Yeah. Out number one is you leave it to your kids. Statistically, when I say statistically, less than ten percent of children now go into the family business. It's not like it was when our when when our parents were kids, where mm -hmm. it's like. No, you will go into the family business. Yeah. And if you think of doing otherwise, like you're, going to school you're not to, coming to over come, for holidays yeah. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but nowadays, not only do kids not want to come into legacy family businesses, parents are encouraging their kids to go do something else. Mm. So, um, so that kind of succession planning is, is it's certainly an option, but it's a long shot. It's a long shot. Um, the other way out is uh, you just die. And like you, the, you've the now goes, saddled this, your com your family with this company in this industry that you had a sick passion for that they probably don't. So you're not doing them a favor. Uh, the wise option is to sell it. So I always think of it as it's not a matter of if you're going to sell. It's just a matter of when. And most of the people that we meet that are ready to sell, they may be ready to sell, but their business is not. Mm. Uh, they just wake up and say, you know what, uncle. I've had enough. Yeah. I'm out. And they expect that that'd be like waking up Saturday morning saying, I'm going to sell my house and I'm going to put it on the market today. Yeah. The realtor is going to walk in and says, no, you're not. Yeah. Fix <laughs> that. You got, touch that. You got that. purple carpet. You've yep. got pink yeah. walls. Yeah. You've got this, that, and the other is wrong with it. You're going to have to put a lot of time and effort into making that house ready. You can probably nail that in a few months. Okay. It's different than a business. It's, you're going to need more than a few months of planning to really prepare for the best liquidity event of your life. Um, so so what we, are those yeah, steps? That's, yeah. Well, what are know, the top two, top three things the, the, that a, a seller should be looking at within their business? Well, certainly you should be looking at the financial profile of your business because a buyer is buying your business because of what they can do with your cash flow and build on that. Mm -hmm. So making sure that your financial house in order um, is, is, is paramount. The second thing they're going to be looking at, it's not necessarily you know, in this order, these are equally important, is your management and leadership team. This is not a business of equipment. This is a business of people. people. Oh, yeah. And last time I checked, there's a shortage of people in this industry, yeah. especially really good ones. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for a pulse and a social security number, they're out there. And pulse. Pulse. you know, and and you know what, the pulse is optional. Yeah. But you know, if you're if if you're running background checks, you got to have social security number. Mm -hmm. So, um, the leadership and management is is a, is a very highly prized asset that you need to make sure is intact. And that doesn't include you as the business owner. The worst employee for a buyer is the business owner. Mm -hmm. There's a reason you own a business. It's probably because you're a terrible employee. <laughs> I, I would be. Yeah. I mean, I, I was working on the business, have, working, have, on, have, have working on another company. That would hire me. <laughs> it just, I would just not. Plus, the owner is leaving usually. You yes. Well, yeah, owner, we had talked about that too. Yeah, that's the other thing. Nine out of ten people that leave a janitorial business are leaving because they're either burnt out or they're retiring. They're retiring. Yeah. That is not the ideal employee. Mm -hmm. If somebody walked in your door right now and said, "I'm really burnt out and I don't want to work anymore," will you hire me? That's they're, that's that's not a good no. thing. <laughs> or if they say I'm a year out from retirement, will you hire me? Again, the answer is no. So for a buyer, uh, they're generally not going to get the the uh, the benefit of having the owner stick around. And there are some business owners that are delusional that think they do want to continue to work for another three to five years, and they're going to be an awesome leadership member on the team. Most of them are wrong. They figure out that I don't do well working for somebody else. Mm. So I hear that a lot. Um, yeah. But um, but there are the exceptions. I know a number of people in this industry that have sold their business to their buyer, and they're very happy. So that's the exception. Yeah, that's the exception. But it's and out it, there. And it's so the financials is important. The leadership and leadership. management is important. Your underlying customer sector. You could put two companies side by side, making the same amount of money. But one company is servicing healthcare, technology, and industrial. The other company is servicing retail and malls, making the same amount of money. W one company is worth much yeah, more because than the, the other, client, even though the cash flow is the same. Mm. So it's, it's taking a hard look at your customer base, 
is it in a growing sector, a declining sector, or a mature sector? So office space is mature, which means it's not bad, but it's not great. Mm. So uh, ideally, you look at a, your, your customer sector many years in advance of a sale and say, I need to pivot. I need to be moving my customer concentration over to growing sectors. And that's not only going to help my growth, but it's going to make my business more valuable. So what's um, an example of a growing sector? Uh uh, you know, really where we see new infrastructure coming out of the ground. So think about healthcare environments, think about higher ed, um, think about manufacturing, industrial. Uh, those are all sectors that are growing at, at kind of mid to high single digit percentages okay. every year, as opposed to kind of flat or 2% growth. Now, uh, again, this is, don't have to be uh, exact, but... Is there a good percentage that, that you would have of different sectors? Like, for example, 25% healthcare, 20% industrial. Like, what's a good balance for people to be thinking about? Because, again, it doesn't have to be today, but they could work towards that, right? Yeah, I guess I wouldn't be too concerned about the, um, uh, about the mix. I mean, okay. because there's also value in a company that specializes in something. So, you know what? All we do is medical space. Or all we do is clean room type space. Or like senior um, care living, right? I know it, some companies it, it, that they focus right. on senior so care. So there, there's value to that specialization. So you, you, you don't have diversified customer bases, which is different than having a diversified number of customers, right. um, which, is, which is one of the other things, you know, as it relates not just the industry that you're servicing, but how many customers represent double digit percentages of your revenue. Okay. Every time you got a customer that's 10% or more of revenue, that's a strike against you, not for mm -hmm. you. It's, it's a problem. Because yeah, wow. if that customer goes, then 10% of every, your business Every goes. customer that you've got that's <laughs> like one-tenth of a percent of revenue, that's a strike against you too. Nobody wants to buy a, a $5 million company that has 500 customers. Yeah. That's a lot less interesting than a $5 million company that has 50, 50 customers. 50 customers. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. You don't want anybody keeping you awake. But you don't want customers that are like, oh, gosh, that customer's calling. We make mo no money off that customer. They're more needy than my, my million-dollar customer. Because that's the way it plays out. Makes sense. So just to piggyback on, on emotion, uh, when you said that, I, I connected because I said no to a buyer just because I, I thought that buyer was going to mess up my business. Even though there's, it was not going to be my business anymore, uh, I, I said no. I was lucky to have three or four buyers that I interview with, mm -hmm. so I could pick and choose, but uh, and maybe it was just a little bit tiny more money, but I said, no, I, I don't want you to kill my baby you know, in the future. So I, yeah, that's a really important thing. And same thing with numbers. So I, I went through a broker and man, I was not ready with numbers. So it was a lot of work that I had to put in place just to be ready for a sale. Um, I kind of, yeah, I, I felt connected with that. So I wanted to take I want to pivot the conversation a little okay. bit because Big Dom gave me some great notes here. But let's get back to the cocktail real right. quick because, yeah. as you can see, Mark is a fit guy here. <laughs> you were talking about gyms, and I, I, I was going to, I wanted to let you finish your thought. But so you first started with gyms, right? You're, we're, you know, we're drinking a healthy drink. You're, you're in CrossFit, or you're always preparing and training for CrossFit. Could you? How has that helped you as, as a business owner and then helping other business owners make some tough decisions mm -hmm. uh, and decision-making, right? It's, is, obviously, fitness is a part of your life. You were, you were buying gyms in your 20s, yep. and you're still a part of it. So why is it so near and dear to you? Um, um, so in, in pretty much anything that I engage in, whether it be a professional, uh, I'll call it activity, or personal, um, I am at my best in if, if it's in a competitive situation. I, I don't, I'm not really half into anything. Um, I'm either all in or I'm all out. And what gets me all in is if there's a competitive situation. Doesn't mean it's necessarily I got to destroy the other person type of thing, <laughs> but it has to be a competitive situation. Uh. And um, my first uh, experience with fitness was as a teenage bodybuilder. And I moved on to try a variety of different fitness paths after that for my own personal passion. When CrossFit came on the scene um, back in, in the... When you owned your gyms, I mean, CrossFit wasn't around. Didn't exist. Didn't exist. Yeah, CrossFit's only been around for 
you know, like 12, 15 years. Okay. Wow. Um, that's 12, 15 years. Oh, yeah. wow. So when CrossFit came on the scene, I remember watching it on, on, on TV. And I'm watching these people, and I'm like, they're running, they're doing deadlifts, and they're doing pull-ups, and then and looks, you know, and then they're swimming. Crazy. This is crazy. Yeah. This is a mess. Yeah. It looks ridiculous. And like you see and, them doing it, and you're just like, and all that, that translated into this looks awesome. <laughs> oh. um, because did, I was did you see it as a challenge at first, though. Because uh, you just oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, when when uh, I was always in, in pursuit of a sport that was going to lend itself to my body composition, I was not. You know, I wasn't going to be the most muscular guy. So I, you know, I wasn't going to be a power lifter. I was never going to be the smallest, you know, thinnest person. So I was never going to be the fastest runner. Mm -hmm. uh, what I needed was a sport that really played best to somebody that was very chameleon-like, that can move from strength to conditioning to gymnastics and be really good at all of them. Uh, so that was one of the things that was appealing about the sport because of because of my body composition. So um, you know, I called two CrossFit gyms. Uh, by me, you know, here in the Chicago suburbs, I left a message at both of them, and I said the first one that calls me back is where I'm going to go. That's where I'm going to go. And uh, one in Libertyville called me back, CrossFit Freedom, and the guy answered the phone. I answered the phone, and he says, "What do you want to do?" I said, "Well, I want to compete at the CrossFit Games." So he probably hears that all the time. Yeah, he says, <laughs> "Yeah, he's like, yeah, right, whatever." <laughs> but the, the CrossFit Games is where the top ten to twenty people in the world, out of thousands would advance and hope to advance to get to the games. I said, I want to compete at the CrossFit Games, and uh, that's the only reason why I'm doing this. I'm not doing this for my health. Yeah, I, I can work out at home yeah. for my health. I need somebody to get me to the CrossFit Games. So he said, fine. I said, I got a great foundation of fitness. I'm strong. I got it. So I started doing CrossFit, and within a month, I was just destroyed. Wow. I was humbled. Yeah. Um, that's what I'm saying. It's got to be a humbling experience. I was humbled. Wow. I was shit. And so I dedicated the next two, three years to being the best I possibly could at every single movement in CrossFit. Um, I made it to the games uh, in 2021. So I ranked number 17 out of the 5,000 people nice. in my age group. And I've continually remained in the, anywhere in the, between the top 20 to 50 people in the world um, in CrossFit. And just to give you a frame of reference, the difference between whoever is number 20 and number 50 is, you know, just watch the Olympics. The person that finishes in first place versus last place yeah, in the race, it's, it's, it's a second. star apart. <laughs> so uh, so I, what I'm saying is I got a ton of respect for anybody that's in the top 100 yeah. um, because they're right there. They're, and, they're right there. And we were talking about this, like, uh, you, you're you on all the time. Well, right? like, like this so one, right now, when we preparing. leave this interview, I'm going to do a qualifier event to compete at a North American competition. And that goes off at one o'clock today. So I'm not going to be at my best if I've got a martini in me yes. um, in advance Hence, of that. We're not drinking. So that's you know. why we're doing some protein and creatine. Yes. We're not doing a cocktail. So I got to believe that, you know, because you hear it all the time, right? I, you know, I talk about mindset all the time. Do you feel that this helps you uh, from like to turn on the business mindset? Oh, yeah. the, so this is my, the, uh, so fitness is my outlet. I mean, as you can imagine, I'm saddled with a lot of responsibility in our role mm -hmm. as investment bankers and m and advisors. We get involved in transactions that are generally the largest spend or, or largest liquidity event of anybody's of life. Of anybody's life, yeah. And that is a personal responsibility as much as it is as a business responsibility that weighs on me. And uh, this is my outlet. So two hours a day uh, is my commitment off season. And, and that resets me. And allows me to perform at an optimal level professionally. Nice, you see, see, I got these guys. We they went to their first. Uh, it was a circuit training, uh, so I'm part of a gym in Glen Ellen, and uh, I go. I work out two, mm -hmm. three times a week, and I just love what it does for me. So I invited the team to come, and uh, Big Dom almost fainted. Mm -hmm. But uh, like, did you guys? Did you appreciate that? For, first day, I almost. Threw well, you up. almost threw up. <laughs> but, like, so, I, you guys went two times now. So how, how was no, this? No, I mean it makes a huge difference. I know. I might look like I'm a gym guy because my no. sick, but no, it's a trick. So, so no, I, 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 I can tell the difference when you work out. Like briefly, you know, I used to play soccer. So when you feel good physically, like fitness wise, man, like yeah. you have more energy. You just want to it. Kill kick it starts today. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But you don't stop there. You also climbed mountains. Right. Oh, yeah. like I said, I don't do anything half fit. So um, I used to be a mountain climber. I used to be a kickboxer. I used to oh, be wow. a taekwondo fighter. 
um, I was kind of like Goldilocks, wandering around from, from sport to sport and activity to activity until I found something that was just right. Um, and um, yeah, I, I guess if you type in my name on Google, you find anything I've ever done because it's always, for better or worse, made it onto Google. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but I, I mean, you got you to gotta appreciate that. Like, it's just, again, like you're always on, but it, it just, you could see that reflects with, on you with business too. People right? say, how do you relax and, and unwind? From what you're but doing, but that is relaxing. You know, That's what right? it is. Yeah. I wouldn't know what just chilling means. Uh, that's not that's not an escape for me. That builds anxiety for me to yeah. to do nothing. It builds anxiety for me. See, for for me, instead of doing all that, I just deal with my three year old. Uh, that, you there know, you <laughs> it's almost you about the same. Yeah. So, another thing I want to talk about is because I think we have we have some synergies in, that I didn't realize. So I just reference is uh, Inc. Five Thousand. So. <laughs> You made it to Inc. Five Thousand uh, as percent, or did you get? No, that that was, that, that, was a, that was capital cleaning. Capital cleaning. So one of my one of my companies, we were number one twenty one out of five hundred. Um, back. You got to think about that many cleaning back, companies make way back when make yeah. that. So well, uh, yeah, not not many people make it, and it, and it's um, and if you're going to make it, it's generally going to happen in the earlier years of your business, just because that's when it's easier to pull off that hundred, two hundred, oh, yeah. three hundred percent percent growth. growth. Yep. But you know, there's yeah, that as you get bigger, it just gets tougher and tougher. So, Ricky, let's pivot over to you now. Um, your acquisition. Mm -hmm. You want to share a little bit of your experience? Yeah. For again, we want people as you're listening to everybody too, like be thinking about you. You should have taken some notes on what Mark was saying earlier. Um, creating that hit list of what mm -hmm. what we have in preparation. Could you say that you had those things in order? That no. <laughs> so. So, that, so the, there's, I would say there's a lot of people that want to pivot from residential to commercial cleaning. And they're always thinking about, you know, should we sell the residential? Should we uh, just do both residential and commercial? I, I chose to sell my residential business mm -hmm. and then move into commercial. Now, <clears throat> what you said, yeah, uh, be ready with your numbers. Uh, management plays a big role. I wasn't ready with the numbers, so I had to, like, do a lot of work. So what could you say to those people to, like, be ready if they want to sell a year from now. You know, it's a possibility. What can they do to, like, be ready? I would encourage, uh, so again, let's go back to the house example. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to sell your house, one of the first things you do is you call in a few realtors. And you would ask them, to you know, what, do you, what do you think, you know, my home is worth? What, what do you think I should uh, do to it to make it more appealing to the marketplace? And they will tell you, this is, a, uh, this is an attractor and this is a detractor. And the same thing goes for thinking about an exit in your business. Call in investment bankers or business brokers. The difference between a business broker is it's generally going to be a deal that's going to be either hundreds of thousands of dollars or a few million. Uh, and investment bankers are generally working on deals that are kind of 10 million and up. They, but they both will have an eye that has been trained by the marketplace to see your business through to say, this is what's going to be appealing about your business. This is what is going to be a detractor about the business. So they will give you the list of what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you may or may not need to engage a third party to help you with some of those things. You're generally always going to want to engage a third party to help you with restructuring of, of financial reporting. Um, you know, we report our financials to what we kind of want. Yeah. Yeah. It works for me to look at it like that. What, what do you expect it to pay? So for me, it was 10% with a business broker. I had to pay 10% of the sale to the business broker. Is that like uh, something average in the industry or it's, it could be all over. The place? Uh, so, so that's where you so differ range. than real estate because real estate is, you know, it's kind of a, like a fixed fee. Yeah. Okay. But if you're, if you're with a business broker, um, you know, business broker is going to work off of a higher percentage like that, maybe like 10% or a hundred thousand dollar minimum. If it's a smaller, that type of thing, if it's a smaller deal, if it's a smaller yeah. deal. As the purchase price grows, the percentage is going to come down. So for a, uh, I'll, I'll use the term middle market company for a middle market company, which is what investment bankers deal with. And a middle market company would have on the low end kind of 10 million in enterprise value or purchase price. Uh, and up to hundreds of millions uh, in value, you're dealing with low to mid single digits. Okay. So anywhere from 2% to 5 or 6%, and that scales according to the purchase price. The higher the purchase price, the lower the percentage. Right. Makes yeah. sense. No, I mean, 
again, you're paying for what you get too. Like absolutely, we were, we were talking about how competitive it is. Like you know, you're here, right? We're we're talking on the Rose Lotto side, having good conversations on that. Where if you have a plan to st- strategically grow, uh, it's good to have somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, for <laughs> what, what we talked about, like the time it would take for us to try to do that, the time it would take for us to go out there and like try to do this on our, on our own. Um, yeah. You may think you can, right? Or again, a deal may fall on your lap. Like we had a great opportunity. It right. presented itself. But that's, especially in this market, that's probably not going to happen, right? That's yeah. what we we're, were talking about earlier. What we do in our business consulting practice is we have, for example, a form of coaching that we do. Uh, it's not coaching in, in the traditional sense of, you know, hey, I'm having a bad day. Can we figure out how to get through this? Um, it is coaching in a sense of uh, really helping a business owner over a period of years optimize the performance of their business to a point where they can maximize value on an exit. So it, it does incorporate traditional coaching relationships whereby, you know, how are you managing your people? How are you managing your strategic plan? What are the, some of the strategic decisions that you're making? Are you staying out of the weeds? But but it also incorporates the final destination. What do we want to have happen five mm. years from now? Yeah. And that's our goal line that we're working towards as opposed to uh, just talking once a month about whatever's going on at the time. Yeah. Where is all that taking us? So there, uh, and it's not a pitch for percent. There are firms out there that you can reach out to and say, I want to hire a coach that is going to help me maximize value mm. over the course of the next three to five years and is also going to help me deal with some of the drama that comes up in the interim and help me think about that the right yeah. way. And that's all. And we'll, we're going to take a quick break, but I want to end on that point where yep. he said coach and mentor, right? So you, you think about in our space too, in the cleaning space, there are more and more coaches and mentors mm-hmm. and education that's coming out. But I think a lot of those are for your, for your business side, right? Mm-hmm. To re- to help you manage business or get sales. Yeah. This is still different, right? This is a whole other level of mentorship or coaching. Different, it's a different, it's type, a diff- different type of coaching and mentorship, yeah. right? Cool. All right. I'm going to do it. Let's take a break to do a fill up. We know managing a commercial cleaning company can be overwhelming. And let's not forget about managing your inventory and supplies. It's not an easy task to ensure you have everything you need to keep your operation running smoothly. That's why we're here to help you take control of your business so you can do what you do best. Managing your business. Introducing Rob Pulse, our innovative software designed specifically for commercial cleaning companies. We give you access to your data in real time to unlock the pulse of your business. With Rob Pulse, you can streamline your operations, optimize your resources, and grow your business like never before. Join the Rob Network today and supercharge your business. Discover the pulse of your business. Visit GetRoute.com or click the link below and schedule a demo and let Route power your success. And we're back. Let's continue that conversation right now. So uh, we're, we're talking about the pace on climbing a mountain. Yes. Right. So yeah. uh, go over that again real quick. So we yeah. So get- we were talking about climbing in the Himalayas and, you know, the difference between climbing like um, Mount Everest, which is about a three, th- a three month you know, commitment versus some of the other peaks, which are nearby, which are two to 3,000 feet lower. So 26, 27,000 feet, you can do that in about half the time. And, you know, part of that is weather on Everest is very different. So it throws a lot more into the time planning. Um, Some of the technical aspects of Everest slow things down a lot. Um, Whereas like Alberis, where I climbed, um, there's not a lot of technical on that. What your, your, your major obstacle you're dealing with is just the elevation. The elevation. So yeah. the acclimatization to the altitude, um, it's, it's two, three weeks just to get to base camp. And it's not because it's so far. It's because you can't elevate more than a couple thousand feet a day. Yeah. Otherwise, you just are going to expose yourself to high risk of altitude sickness. So, Mark, because I, I like to tie, the, tie things back to business all the time, too, is as I hear you talk and you're going through the different elements, right? Business, running a business, there's so mm-hmm. many different elements, but you, you spoke on pace. Yeah. Do you, that could, you could relate that to running a business, right? Like growing too fast versus growing, you know, at a pace that you can handle and, and have capacity for like, 
It, do you relate that? Is that like, do you feel like it's the same kind of thing you can do? What, yeah, you, yeah, how yeah. you climb a mountain and Absolutely. you reach that point? If you grow of a personal experience, right. anytime we experienced a surge in growth, the organization would start to shake and shudder and things would fall off. <laughs> it's like you're going too fast than what you're built to do. Mm. Um, so slow down, make the improvements in the organization that need to be made to support that new level of volume. And that's generally going to be people and processes. You're going to have to elevate what you have in terms of people, and you're going to have to improve your processes to accommodate the new volume and then grow. A lot of times you don't get that luxury. You know, a new customer calls yeah. up and says, says, good news, $10 million is <laughs> coming your way, you know, Story starting next life. month. Let's do it. And, 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 and we're entrepreneurs, we're it's like, what could go wrong? Yeah. So we take it on, and the organization starts to shake and shudder. And, you know, even myself, you know, during that period of time, you know, you'd, you'd pick up $5 million, you'd lose a million. You'd pick up $8 million, you lose $2 million. Yeah. And you probably never would have lost that other revenue had you not taken on the new revenue yeah. because – your organization wasn't prepared to 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 accommodate the new size, and things got neglected. Balls got dropped. Yeah, I mean, and but I, I got that climbing the mountains the same way. Yeah. If you go up too fast, like you said, you're gonna barf. You, you're you're <laughs> gonna get sick, yeah. and, and, and the only way you're gonna fix that is you have to go back down. Oh, so that's and, and then your body and your body adjusts. Oh, then you can go back up, Ooh. and the same thing happens in business. Right, you know, you get humbled. And you lose a bunch of revenue, and you're like, "Time out. Let's 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 acclimate to where we're at and prepare for the for the for the next push." Mm. And climbing the mountains the same way. And, and usually that means people in process. Yeah. It, in in business, yes. And you know, in mountain climbing, it's it, it's building more red blood cells yeah. to carry more oxygen. Wow. Now. I mean, you could say building technology is the same thing, right? You build too much, yeah. You can break, you break right? <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> so, speaking of technology, uh, Mark, how important do you think? Obviously, the space is getting very innovative. Mm -hmm. A lot of innovation is coming, right? We're building technology ourselves. How important do you think, or how important is innovation and the technology companies are using when they're going to either sell or when a buyer is coming in? Is it an important component now, or are you seeing it? Yeah, so I guess the first thing I have to do, to do is define important okay. and also say, well, does it mean I'm going to sell for more? Am I more valuable because of the technology I have in the business? Okay. So um, the, the answer to that is, uh, so, so first of all, yes, technology is important because it's any, the more you can tech enable your business, the better. Okay. Because that should ultimately reduce headcount improve productivity, that better result in better margins. Otherwise, like, why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? It, yeah. it all comes so, down to numbers. It all comes down to yeah. margins. So, you know, like, we've got a client that we're working with. We've worked with them for many years, uh, much like in the capacity I was telling you about, where we're kind of like their coach. Mm -hmm. We get involved in different engagements with them, and we're advising them to really have an optimal outcome. This is probably one of the most tech-heavy BSC companies I've ever seen. It's cool as shit yeah. that what they're doing with it, but it's yet to be seen whether their margins are going to ultimately be superior to the industry norm or their competitors. Mm. Unless their margins are materially better than the other competitors that are tech light, it means absolutely it will, nothing. It won't mean anything. It means nothing. It's just their preference. I, and I, right? I shouldn't say it means nothing. Somebody could, see that, big could, somebody could see that technology and say, you know what? This company's margins aren't any more superior than anybody else, but this technology I could redeploy yeah. into one of my other businesses that is absent technology. And so there's value so, in that. Yeah, there, there's so the that's value, part of where due play. diligence on your buyers yeah. comes into play. Say, so why is this company interesting to this buyer? And if they tell you it's because your technology is very valuable in some of our other assets, now you've got a position where you can monetize that technology edge. Otherwise, you're you're just going to look cooler. You're not going to be worth anymore. Damn it! No, <laughs> no. so uh, I sound like Kevin O'Leary. It's all about cash flow. I, know. I love Kevin O'Leary. <laughs> so let's let's uh, let's go back. All right, I'm going to take you back to your first couple of years. Um, for those 
people that are, you know, I think the first three years are the toughest. So yeah. I, no, they were the toughest for me opening, owning the cleaning company. Yeah. I was always uh, doubting that, you know, why did I get into this space? Yeah. What would you, what would you tell people that are in their first three years, uh, their first year, uh, you know, they're, they're probably, they're in the business, they're probably cleaning, right? Yep. Any advice or shared experience for them? Yeah, absolutely. To get them pushed that through? You know, for me, um, the, the transition from being a handful of a million, few million dollars in revenue to busting through kind of what I call the $5 million ceiling and then beyond 10, 15, 20, so on and so forth. Um, the, the difference is the ability to achieve success through others rather than yourself. If you've got a one, two, three million dollar company, but it's you, you. you could literally do it all. You could be the salesperson, you could be top ops person. Yeah. Hell, you could even be cleaning toilets at night. And I know that because I did all three things <laughs> during the, those early, early years. And, but my mission was to hire people that were better at what I did and hire enough of them. Not only hire people that are better at, at doing what I was doing than I was, but also people that had already been where I wanted to go. So if I was looking for a top ops person, I was when I was five million. I was not looking for an ops person that had handled five million. I was looking for an ops person that had handled twenty million. million. Yeah, yeah. Well, the problem if you hire the ops person that's fifty million, they're gonna just like, boof, man, I, I've grown out of this, and mm. you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, no, I'm, I'm a little too, too, I'm a little too tactical to <laughs> yeah. come back downstream. Yeah. So, so targeting people that were not only better. At, at what I did, but also had been where I wanted to go. The vast majority of business owners have not done that, yeah. which is why this industry it's very is riddled with very small operators yeah. because they, they, have a hard, they have a work hard mentality. And you don't, everyone will lose that. No. But what are you working hard on? Yeah. Are you working hard on what you need to do today? to get through the day, or are you working hard on what needs to be done to plan for tomorrow? Mm. So it's the classic in the business or on the business. Yeah. When you're small, you're in the business. When you're larger, you're on the business. How do you make that migration? If you can make, as soon as you can make the migration from in to on, you've just busted through the ceiling and sky's the limit. I, th I think it has to do a lot with education. Like people don't know this until they actually learn about this. Uh, yeah, and, and I wouldn't put education in, in, the, in the classical sense of college degrees. No, 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 no. no. no, no. Yeah. Meaning, yeah. meaning educated yeah. about that. Like yeah. Yeah. some people don't know the difference between working in the business and on the business and that yeah. what they can bring. And, and just a level of comfort. Some people are just control fix. Like, no, 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 I got to do that. I got to do they this. They want to micromanage. Do and and you're gonna, you got to lose that. You gotta yeah. If you're going to micromanage and you're going to be a control freak, mm -hmm. you're never going to build a scaled organization. I'm the king of delegation. Oh, you, yes, <laughs> you are. Uh, we got a couple of those. So I, I want to I wanna close out with, because again, I, you started with, and I'd love to end with this, is this is a people business, right? Like this industry is, is about the people. Yep. Uh, you're absolutely right. Like, the companies that I see that have surpassed 5, 10, 15, 20 million, it's the people there that are around them. That's why they're, they're getting to that level and they're growing. They're yeah, still going to grow. Absolutely. Let's, let's close out with, I think this would be a helpful tip if, if you have some, some good shared experience with this, is how, does, how, how do we recruit that talent, though? Like the vision. How do we share the vision of not just your company or your culture or your core values, right? But like, you know, it's the cleaning industry. And when we're trying to find a, a operations manager or a director of, of sales or, and you're trying to bring them to your cleaning company, like, but what, do you, what are some tips or what is something that you would say for cleaning business owners to share that vision I, to recruit? You got to be a sharpshooter. So a, a sharpshooter goes out and finds its targets and lasers in on them and nails them. And what I did as an operator is I made it, my mission to go out and a identify the best companies who are the people that are killing it in this industry you know not maybe in terms of just growth but just great cultures great reputations great reputations for execution and then make it my mission to identify the people within the organization so who's their top ops people who's their top sales people mm. and um and then finding ways to intersect with them. Now, in the, early on, 
I didn't have the advantage of LinkedIn. I didn't even have the advantage of the internet. <laughs> back then. We got so now, yeah. It was called going to the BSCAI trade show mm-hmm. and looking at name badges and going to all the... the None of my the, team is allowed the, to go the, to more the, any the, BSCAI. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, well, they're, they're tar- I mean, if, if I was there, yeah, they're targets, you know, and going to the 3M cocktail receptions and, and, and just rubbing elbows with the people that uh, you really kind of look at and admire and say, man, yeah. if I could afford an ops person like that, yeah. then that'd be my the best Christmas gift. So it should and, be easier now with technology. Absolutely. absolutely. Like social media. I mean, uh, recruiting through uh, just, yeah, re- whether it be LinkedIn or, or, or whatever, just call, we'll call it the web. But like you said, sharpshooter. Like it, yeah, it's you, our job. So if you're, able, if you're getting to that point, you're probably working on the business, right? That is something to be working on, right? Yeah. Like I feel like I, I, I sometimes am a recruiter for for our for all of our brands because I want to build a team. I'm always wanting to build a better and bigger team. Yeah, a, a third of your time should be spent building building your talent. Yeah, period. Third of your time. That's a great point. Yeah. So yeah, Liz. You got work to do. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk to you, Liz. All right. Because uh, we have a There's a lot of smarter people out there than me than that that, will, uh, that, that know that formula. But uh, a third of your time needs to be spent recruiting top talent. Awesome, man. Well, uh, Mark, anything you want to leave us with? Any last words of advice? Uh, to wisdom? No, just a compliment. I love what you're doing. Uh, I wish I would have had the advantage of something like this back when I was an operator uh, to see what was going on in the heads of, of my industry peers. Mm. Um, and you know, you, you make it fun, you make it interesting, uh, you make it intoxicating at times. <laughs> um, you, why are you looking so, at me? Yeah, yeah. I think it's, um, what was it, 11, 12 o'clock? Today? Yeah, it's, it's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> um, so, but no, I love what you're doing and uh, looking forward to seeing more of your episodes. Awesome, well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Let's do a fist bump, fist bump. All right, guys. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you guys for tuning in. Uh, Again, a lot of nuggets here, guys. Mark, I know you'll probably be okay with this. We're going to share your information to everybody online. If you guys have any questions on M&A, business, coaching, understand. Talk. Talk. That's what I'm saying. (laughs) There's no charge for a conversation. Having a good conversation. Uh, Mark, it was insightful. Uh, Again, you dropped some nuggets. I hope everybody else can take advantage. Um, I'll see you at the shows, as we always do. Absolutely. Um, I'll save you a seat in the front row. There you go. Until next time, guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, And we'll see you in the next episode.